We are back with the Good Trouble Equity Talk podcast. Thank you all for being here. We were just really starting to unpack some significant information as it relates to the perspective of law enforcement and the perspectives of community members in terms of law enforcement in the black community. What is your perspective on the state of those dynamics? We're gonna give people a little time to get back in. This is going to be a very important dialogue and conversation. We apologize for the mix up and the glitch. We know we had about 50 plus people in our broadcast and you were here, you showed up for one of the most important conversations that can go on in our country at this time. But we felt it very, very necessary to pause and try and bring Sheriff Alfonso Williams on screen. I've had him on the screen. He's got one computer that takes him in one direction and another that takes him in another direction. And that's a part of being a shirt and the work that he does. We are not able to get him on screen, but we are able to have him join us by phone. So if you're in the broadcast suite, will you please go to the comment section and let us know how well or how well you do or do not hear Sheriff Williams. Sheriff Williams, give us an introduction, sir. Hey, Doctor. Thank you so much for your patience, man. I appreciate that. Uh, we had a campaign event tonight, and I'm late getting on and having some technical difficulties. But I come to you with 30 years of experience in law enforcement. I've uh, uh, had a myriad of different jobs, from police academy director to to uh, sheriff to chief a couple of times. And uh, born and raised in Waynesboro, Burke County, Georgia, the same place you're from, and Dr. Sam's and, and Jeffrey uh, are, are from. And uh, uh, it's an honor to be back here to work and to serve the people. We're in the midst of a campaign re-election season, and uh, we're just here to serve. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. I've been seeing the um, campaign, and it looks like it's ratcheted up a notch, but we're going to have a more global conversation. If there's some time at the end of the show, we'll definitely give you a chance to speak to the people relative to the campaign. People are saying they can hear you well, sure. The only thing they're missing is your handsome face, but we got to get this party started. So the other panelists, they spoke very, very briefly to kick us off about how would you respond if someone came up to you and posed the question, what is your perspective of the current state of policing in the black community? How would you respond to that, Sherry? Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the question. One I anticipated, but one that is fairly loaded. Uh, I think that in, in this country, there's a... a real disconnect between police and community relations and it was only some 20 years ago or so maybe 15 years ago that law enforcement agencies started to warm up to the community in general becoming involved in law enforcement matters when this whole community policing concept is fairly new and so none of the communities had previously been involved with with law enforcement more specifically we're talking about the black community the black community, uh, because of our history, has had a, a disdain or real uh, uh, sheepish uh, uh, point of view about law enforcement and, and police community relations, and, and rightfully so. And, and so we're working every day to try to bridge that gap and, and to try and, and, and put folks in place who, who resemble the communities we serve. But on a caveat to that, Doctor, is that I think many people in the black community tend to think that that law enforcement is is in their communities to 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 harm them. And we're trying to change that down there. We're trying to change that perspective. We're trying to. Uh, but but it's up to each leader to 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 embrace those challenges and work towards overcoming them. And I don't think that some of us are working hard as others to do that. Thank you very much, Laura. I want you to delve into that conversation. Sheriff, we didn't get a chance to get you on earlier. You know these other gentlemen from a professional space. Laura McDonald is the executive director of North Square, which is a social justice organization here in Kansas City. What do you say right now in Kansas City, Missouri, or even more globally, is the state of policing in the black community? Um, so I'm Caucasian, and I, I have very strong opinions about this, just the same. Um, so here's the deal. The very fact that you can ask that question and we all know what you're asking means there's a problem, right? Um, 
nobody asks me what is the state of policing in the white community, right? Um, in fact, we don't even think of ourselves as a single community. We are the community, right? We're a part of the community. Wow. Um, so the very fact that there's a distinct question about that tells us all that we what we already know, there's a problem, right? And we know that, um, as you and I have discussed earlier, uh, there's more saturation of policing in communities that are racially concentrated areas, um, certainly those that are more impoverished areas, um, but usually it's also uh, racial concentration of people of color, right? And we know that with higher saturation, we're going to have more contact with police, right? So that's the very beginning. Um, I think there's also all the things that we see in schools that happen that's another way of looking at a beginning, but um, we see that per capita that in communities that um, have larger populations, there's more law enforcement officers deployed in those communities typically. Um, so that's just like facts, right? Um, if my community is more saturated, I'm more likely to have contact with law enforcement as well. Um, just, you know, even racial bias aside, right? Even if officers don't have that. So um, the other thing that I would lift up about policing, I was really glad to hear the sheriff say that they actively re recruit from the African-American community. And I think everyone does that. And I think it's hard um, when we start thinking about recruiting from the African-American community today? Like what type of officers do we recruit if we don't fix these systems that are primarily um, killing people of color? When there are ass assaults and batteries, they happen far more likely to people of color. Um, and when there's prosecutions, it tends to be black and brown police officers as well. So, wow. um, yeah. And white victim. Uh, the sheriff wants to lean into that narrative. Sheriff, can you hear first of all? Uh, I can hear, and I did. I did hear uh, Miss McDonald's uh, response. Absolutely. Can I just add a few things? Absolutely. So, so, so Doc, I, I do agree with with uh, Miss McDonald that there tends to be a saturation of law enforcement in predominantly black and brown communities more specifically black communities, but I submit that that's likely because those persons, for whatever reason, require more services. And it's not particularly the, the, the leadership that wants to saturate a community that is not requiring services. Uh, from a logistical standpoint, it just wouldn't make sense to say, I want this unit to go and concentrate in this particular community if that community doesn't need the services that the, the law enforcement agency offers. So in a, I, I get that all the time in, in my community. Uh, you're familiar with what we call Victory Drive, where all the predominantly white mm -hmm. people live, not necessarily people with money, but white people live. Well, they don't require a whole lot of services. So it wouldn't make sense for me to divert resources to that particular area if it's not necessary because you can't justify it so i agree that there's a saturation it tends to be a larger uh number of, of, of people in in some communities whether they're they're poor or 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 just have a different uh lifestyle or raising or whatever the case may be but but, but it's because those areas require the services that those persons are deployed to those areas. Well, you know, and that's an in interesting concept. You know, when we listen from the sheriff perspective, we hear that the community requires more services. We have someone on that wants to know what does that mean to require more services? We'll lean into that because the sheriff is saying that some communities require more services. Lars pulling data that says that as communities become more and more black and more and more brown and more and more disenfranchised, there's a greater police presence. So is there such thing from a law enforcement perspective, Jeffrey Hatcher, of over-police in a community? Is there such thing as over-police in a community? Uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, uh, most people, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not an administrator, but I think that uh, most police departments tend to put, like the sheriff said, put cops where it's needed the most. 
and and the data that we get is going to tell us okay uh let's say last year uh we had 50 burglaries in a certain area or we had 100 robberies in a certain area or we had drug activity in a certain area so once we as law enforcement collect that data then we're going to concentrate on that area I, I if i'm if i'm if i'm not mistaken i think that's what the sheriff meant by policing certain areas so for instance in uh you know if you have a, if you if you have um like i said 50 burglars in the area then the people that live in that area they want some done about those burglaries so it's our job as law enforcement is to uh put cops in that area to try to cease or stop some of those burglaries dr sam's lean in yeah, I, I, I can definitely understand that context. Um, I can I can look at it from a different context as well, where it's not just the areas um, that have you know propensity for crime to be committed, but I think also we need to talk about the fact that we have what I what I call the criminalization of just simply being black, and we have people who are just doing regular things, minding their own business. And they're being accused or, or they're being leaned into because they're just simply trying to live, trying to exist, trying to do anything that any other person could do without impunity. And so when we start thinking about when I think about over policing, I look at it from that context. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, we have the backdrop of the, uh, the, the Ahmaud Aubrey situation that we're dealing with. But I mean, I could even think about it from my days as a school administrator where I would have to instruct teachers to say, look, it's not the job of the school resource officer to manage your class, right? You have a responsibility for that aspect. They're there to make sure that there's no criminal activity taking place at our school. That is why they're there. And so they're not there to make Johnny sit down or they're not there to, to, to make sure that, that Sally comes to class. And so we have to start thinking about this from an over-policing perspective, not necessarily just looking at the fact that we have areas where crime is an issue, but also when we don't have those issues and we have individuals who are making things look criminal simply because of the existence of melanin, therein lies a problem that has to be addressed as well. Wow, simply because that's so true. I would uh, and say I, you know, on Friday I was in a neighborhood in Liberty, Missouri, with um, someone I really care about, who's a black man who was looking at a house for sale, and I watched from the truck as he like walked around and peeked in all the windows of this vacant home, and all of a sudden I got terrified because I knew what neighborhood we were in. And I was scared not so much that something would happen if law enforcement, but just that law enforcement might get called and it would be inconvenient because we both had somewhere to be, you know? And um, that's a reality, right? That white women like me don't have to think about very often. And it's such a reality that everyone knows when you say the talk or the conversation, what you're talking about, right? My, my community doesn't use that term. Wow. So th that's a very interesting perspective. And I heard the sheriff trying to get in. But what I'm going to say is that there is something to be said for this, because we saw the other day that a white male took a 32 inch or 38 inch television and he strapped it to his back and he ran for two miles with the television through neighborhoods that were very similar to the neighborhood that Ahmaud Arbery, I'm going to say it, was lynched in. And he didn't get a single look around as it relates to him running through with the television on his back. So this leads me to this concept of bias. Is there true bias in policing? And number one, to my officers, do we believe that there's bias in policing, implicit or explicit? And then number two, what are some programs that you all have been a part of or that you put in place to stem profiling and policing and that implicit or explicit bias. We'll begin with law enforcement. So, so doctor, I, I think there is to, to be very candid and upfront, there is implicit and explicit bias in general. Is it in policing? Yes. Is it in teaching? Yes. Is it in nursing? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's in every profession. I think because 
police have to intervene with a person before a judge or anybody else can take away civil liberties, a police officer has to be involved first. And so I think they're the least educated, least paid, and, and just have a job that most folks would want to do. So uh, if we want to professionalize the, the, the profession, then we're, we're going to have to change mindsets. We're going to have to change attitudes. We're going to have to change the pay. We got to change standards. We got to change leaders. But also, just as we're able to ask these questions, we the greater question might be: Do we have a problem with the black community in terms of how we're raising our children, what we're teaching them, what we're telling them? There is no doubt in my mind, knowing about the Brunswick murder, which has ties to Burke County, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, I graduated with a mom in 1990. So I know Wanda very well. That was a a a uh, that was a, a murder, and there's no doubt about it. Uh, but it's not necessarily a police issue. I, I, I think we have got to un- we've got to ask ourselves what's going on in the black community to require these services. What's going on in the black community such that we will continue saturating poor areas uh, with with poor people? Why can't we get education why can't we get better jobs why can't we stop the the the, the generational uh folks from from living in in public housing how do we get around those things now to get to your question doctor i uh, i kind of i got excited hearing some of this stuff i heard uh dr sam say police uh school police are there uh to prevent criminal activity well we we've got a we got to broaden that perspective and say they are there to engage with children. They're there to teach values and respect and morality and decency and respect for, for authority and police and, 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 and not just there to break up fights, not just there to, to, to investigate cell phone thefts. It, we've, we, and we're not there to manage classroom behavior so much. But, but, you know, in many instances, uh, teachers would not be able to do their jobs if they didn't have law enforcement in, in, those, uh, in, in the schools. Yeah, um, you raise a question, Sheriff, and I think that it's definitely key to the conversation, what's going on in the black community. And there's a lot going on in the black community. So when you talk about the level of disinvestment that's happening in so many of our communities, then of course, to use your terminology, there's going to be a need for services. So I totally agree with that. I guess the bigger question is law enforcement, not unlike any other type of interaction that's people-centered, when you're in a position of authority or you're involved in an organization that has some level of authority, but you have to deal with it in two ways. You have to deal with it from the punitive space and you have to deal with it from the restorative space. Talk yes. to us a little bit about what's going on right now in the county you serve as it relates to balancing that punitive aspect of being the sheriff of a town that has many disenfranchised folks, both black and white. It breaks my heart every week. I look at the true citizen weekly and I look at for the records and who's been arrested. And I constantly see poor black folks and poor white folks being arrested in Burke County, Georgia. That's the same everywhere. That's no knock on Burke County. My question is, how do we balance the punitive and the restorative to really, really change our communities? What are you doing in that area? Well, that, that's, that's, that's a tough question, a great question. I'll tell you what we're doing, a number of things. First, I, I heard somebody say earlier that we need to we need to hire more folks that look like us. Just because a person is black or brown doesn't mean they fit a particular community. Uh, uh, that is black or brown, because if that person's perspective is not right, if his heart is not right, if he's not in this job to serve and not be served, then he's not a fit. He, he's out of bounds. I don't know a lot about sports, but I know you either in bounds or out of bounds. And so we can't just assume because a person is of light color that they're going to properly serve a particular community. So we got to put round pegs and round holes. And we got to weed out those folks who don't fit. We got to engage in latest and best practices. We got to have policies in place. I've worked, I've headed three law enforcement agencies, and I don't go to an agency where I don't require body cameras to be rolling at all times. 
And, and so over time, they may not trust me up front, but over time, if they see that when a person comes in to complain about an interaction with law enforcement, I'm able to say, sit at the desk, let's pull up the video and watch it together, and let's discuss this together. And when they understand that the officer can't cut it off and on and can't erase anything and can't tell the sheriff, oh, sheriff, I forgot to charge my battery last night, uh, so I didn't have that recorded on, on video. Those are unacceptable excuses. Now you can go 40 miles up the road to an agency that is nationally accredited and that that sheriff will not allow his folks to wear body cameras. Mm. So, mm. so, and so we, if you want to push something, push for, for more professionalism. I, I say this to my white counterparts in law enforcement all the time. Y'all are always fussing about black lives matter and some of these other, other, uh, uh social groups professionalize yourselves and then those folk like Rodney King's situation and and some of these other situations won't have to dictate our professionalism if we'll professionalize ourselves but we won't do it because we still have good old boys we still have folks who are not as 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 learned uh, uh leading these positions and we still have people in the country that look down on law enforcement with disdain so they don't want to spend tax dollars to professionalize they don't want to hold sheriffs accountable they elect them because they're afraid of them and and they're afraid to go against them and and so we keep putting people in office that don't have a best interest at heart wow it's more political it's more about politics and money than anything else yeah wow. money, 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 money. money but it's 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 it comes down to the, the it, what does it take for me to stay in power that's what every politician is concerned about even in the school system, uh, not everybody cares. You got people teaching children that don't even love children so, or driving the bus that don't like children. So they're there because it benefits them financially. This is the and Good Trouble Equity Podcast. We got Sheriff Williams with us. We have Officer Hatcher. We got Dr. Sams. We have Lauren McDonald. Super excited. We talked about what's going on in the black community and D. Dean just laid it out on the line and you can see it there on the screen institutional racism has fostered the inequity that plagues the black community. Institutional racism is the bent yard of the inequities that plague the black community. What do you say to that, Dr. Sams? Uh, I can't say it any better um, than that. When, when, when you have a situation where um, inequality um, is is a perpetual thing. It's not even like a casual or a one-off, but it's a perpetual state of existence. It just continues to feed off of itself, both for the people who benefit and for those who are afflicted by it. And so we can't we can't act as if this is a this is a singular approach that we've got to address this. And I've often said this too, is that we you know racism is the only thing by which those who are afflicted by it are expected to solve the problem that caused it to happen in the first place. I've never seen a situation in any other, other aspect where you've expected the victims to, to, to solve the problem that, of the victor. And so we've got to engage our, our white brothers and sisters and say, look, we can't solve this by ourselves. I'm sorry. We can address all kinds of things with our homes. We can address things in our personal spaces, but the institution of racism cannot be solved explicitly and intentionally by the people who are the most victimized by it. Absolutely, it's, it's an unfair ask and it's an unfair proposition because these same communities have served as the essential below as it relates to the dynamic of power. And we heard the sheriff clearly reference power but in order for power to exist, somebody has to occupy that position that Ta-Nehisi Coates calls the essential below. Right. And we know who those folks are in many of our communities. And in order for that to change, there has to be clear, clear leadership around those structures that have been in place that have perpetuated the need for additional services, additional policing and the like. Thank you all for elevating that portion of the conversation. I think we all can agree that as it relates to the black community and policing, there's this issue of trust. There's this trust dynamic. And so preparing yes. for this show, I really tried to get my head around why is there so much distrust in the law enforcement community? And as a superintendent of schools and doing this work in multiple states, 
I've been in some of the rooms at the highest levels of leadership in some thriving communities. And here's what I think I've learned about law enforcement from my perspective. And I want the officer and the sheriff, Officer Hatcher and Sheriff Williams to lean in. But there appears to be to the naked eye coming from the community, this unspoken rule that police officers don't do a lot to speak out about unethical or just bad actors in their profession. And I've never felt that pressure as a superintendent to say there's another superintendent who's really doing something bad by children, but I better keep my mouth closed. I never operated that way as a superintendent. I would be willing to say inappropriate, not necessary, not right. But when the community sees that that voice is slow to come from law enforcement, in my mind, as I've been processing the last few days preparing for the program, that probably generates some distrust. What would you What would you all say to that as members of the law enforcement community? Start with Hatcher, coming back to Sheriff Williams. Um, I will say that, yes, trust is the issue, but I, I, I will say that whenever law enforcement does something wrong, the public needs to understand that there's a process. There's a process that has to take place. Uh, and let me give an example, if I may. If you have a doctor that somebody goes in and sees, sees a doctor and he and he's having surgery and he dies on the table, the police don't come right in and arrest the doctor. So when 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 whenever you have law enforcement that does something wrong, there's a process that has to take place because you got to remember when we get up and get dressed to go to work, we put on a gun. We put a, a gun is what we, you know, we put on a gun to go to work. So you gave me a gun. So that must mean that at some point I may have to use that gun. You understand? So I see how you're looking, Dr. Carpenter. But what I'm saying to you is you have to allow everything to run its course whenever there's a law enforcement killing or uh, any kind of thing that law enforcement has done wrong. It's a process. You have to file a complaint. Absolutely, there's due process in all professions. Exactly, and we're gonna we're gonna honor that there's due process. That's but right. even when processes run their course, the community tends to feel like, when am I gonna hear from a key law enforcement official? Well, 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 well. That's and really, that is something that the media and local outlets just have to push and push and push. Because, because once again, Sheriff Williams, we're gonna go to Sheriff Williams. Go ahead. I agree with, with what you had to, had to say, but Doctor, I also agree with you. And as sheriff, I, I promised myself when I became sheriff that I would be transparent, good, bad, or ugly, and that I would never hide behind some mouthpiece or some lawyer in a fancy suit. So when we have situations happen here in Burke County, you're going to get it. You're going to get it fast. You're going to get it you're going to get it as open as we can be. You don't have to file any kind of formal request to get it. We take complaints over the phone. Uh, when I got here, and I've been at a number of agencies where the police don't want to take complaints over the phone. You've got to come in and sit down in person and see somebody and sign a two-page statement saying that you, if you get caught lying, you're going to be, you can be prosecuted. We don't do that. We're open. We're transparent. We're above board. We, we're going to tell the truth no matter how it shakes out and over time. So that's what's happened in, in a number of law enforcement agencies around the country. Leaders are not building relationships. That's why you see, you won't find another sheriff's office within a hundred miles of Burke County that invest as much in the community as we do here in Burke County, because we've got to build trust. We build trust through relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a leadership class one time that said, the cleanup starts. The cleanup starts before the crisis occurs. Now, one might ask, "How do you clean up if you don't have a crisis?" Well, we clean up before the crisis by building relationships, by investing in our community. You read. You said you read for the record every week to see uh, dis, uh, disenfranchised folks arrested every week. That is true. But you got to somehow be able to measure that against all of the community service things that we do to show this community that we love them. We love you. We're going to invest in you, but we're not going to tolerate you, your, your, your criminal activity because we love you. You mm -hmm. don't let your children do what they want to do because you love them. 
and you give them discipline because you love them. On the, by the same token, we do the same thing. We're investing in them. We have we we've got some community program going on every month in this county, every month, several times a month. But we got to hold them accountable as well because we love them. So so building relationships helps to bridge that gap and then people will start to trust you when they see that you really care about them you've heard that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care absolutely so we're showing that we care we have some community in a myriad of different ways that we love folks as well the media can i really address very quickly the police and the media yes sir you, quickly the police shy away from the media because most of them don't know how to talk to the media. They don't know how to deal with the media. They don't have a good rapport with the media. They don't trust the media. They hear the president of the United States saying fake news every day, and they believe that garbage, and it erodes the value of the information. It erodes the First Amendment uh right to freedom of speech and so so people don't tend to believe the media they don't trust the media and law enforcement executives across the country are very shy about talking to the media and and and, and but they do it at the detriment of the people they serve because if you're not open and transparent and above board and and you don't let them in to see what's going on and when you have a situation like we had in brunswick where they cover it up for two months that's a black eye on law enforcement Everywhere. Across the world, across the country, yes, absolutely. Yes. We're going to be paying for that mistake for the next twenty years. Yes, Just like we did in Rodney King and so many of these other injustices. It it it's not the same. So so so, but it's no different than what you see. I've I've, I've worked uh, in the school system in, in Augusta. I don't care what a teacher does in Augusta, you, you, you are hard pressed to get run off. If you're not a janitor or a bus driver, uh, you, you, you stay 30 years and you're going to get your retirement. Now, all of us know in law in, in, in the educational arena, coaches who touch females and did in, many inappropriate things to, to students and they get to stay 30 years and finish out their retirement and go home. That's People unfortunate. Raise as much saying about that as they will for some police officer who commits some some intolerable act or some illegal act well and so it, it happens across all spectrums yeah um and, and and i agree that there is definitely wrongdoing across the continuum but i also believe that it's imperative that we speak up when we see injustice regardless of role and i think that in turn builds greater trust great great conversation trust is one of those key issues as it relates to the community dynamic. Um, we had some individuals leaning into the conversation and Mr. Kirkwood, I wanna pull this to the screen. It says the, judici the, the judicial system was created without African-Americans in mind. How can we trust the process when we were not and are still not at the table when thus said processes were created? We were on the proverbial menu, Mr. Kirkwood. There are lots of historical pieces that we can look at in terms of the history of policing and where that comes from. And that type of hatred that does have some racial overtones and undertones is hard for a community to erase. You know, I can recall some police activity in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and that was late 70s, early 80s. And I didn't have words for some of the things that I saw then, but I have plenty of words for it now. And what a travesty, what a travesty that went on. So I believe that it's super important to have this conversation and to have this conversation with race on the table, with race on the table, because unfortunately we try to X race off the table, but race is real. Liberty Street doesn't get policed in Waynesboro, Georgia, like Magnolia Acres gets policed. Now, maybe we say that they need more services. I can agree with that to some degree, but I also know that Hardy's in the Lake didn't get policed the same when I was in high school. I agree with that, Dr. Hardy's well, in the Lake didn't question, get policed then. the same. Yeah, Hardy's in the Lake didn't get policed the same. And for the benefit of our audience, <laughs> African Americans hung out when I was a high school kid at the Hardy's. And the white folks hung out at the lake. And you can't tell me we were not more police at Hardest than the lake. Go ahead, sir. 
<laughs> I, I, I agree with you that, that 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 black folks will probably police more. But can you ever recall, ever, ever recall a white person shooting another white person in Waynesboro, ever, on the street? A white person shooting another white person in Waynesboro. I don't know that I can recall it, but what I would say is that the it was not. Where they hung out? Did they ever stab one another? Did they ever shoot one another? Uh, did did they require as many services? That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, I mean, so so let, let, I guess I'll pose this to you. I don't recall anybody getting killed at the lake. I don't recall anybody getting killed at Hardy's either. So that the oh, 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 let me let me get to his question. But I guarantee you, because they had way more resources than all of us combined at the Hardys, they had more resources up there, financial resources than the like at the lake. I guarantee you they were drinking more liquor and smoking more dope than we were, but they didn't get policed on the way home the way that we did. Now, I'd be willing to bet on that, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'd be willing to bet on that because they had more resources to do it with. Well, well you know, look, I... I I can tell you that, you know, in these private schools where they pay seven hundred dollars a month to go or a thousand dollars a month to, to attend, there's as many drugs in, 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 in those schools as there are in the public schools. Okay? Absolutely. It, 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 but I get beat up about that all the time. Why don't you go over on Victory Drive in the white area and 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 why don't you why don't you catch the white man that's bringing it in on the boats and the planes and and stop messing with these low drug dealers on the street corner. Well, the Burke County Sheriff's Office doesn't have a boat or an airplane to go catch that guy who's bringing it in from Mexico. So I've got to get the guy that's on the corner that I can afford to get, the one who's a nuisance, the one who is who is driving down your property values. That's all I can get because that's all Burke County will allow me to, to go after. My resources are not so vast that I can get the guy that's bringing it over here from Mexico. So that's just a an excuse. It's almost like, well, they took prayer out of schools and now schools are going to hell. People make excuses about that. Your kid can close his eyes and pray all day long if he wants to, and nobody's going to interrupt that. But but we got to just we got to stop making excuses. And I, and I think that that to say that, well, you know, you spend all this time over here in this project area or this public housing area, and you don't spend time. Well, that that area over there is not requiring the resources. Yeah. We're counting numbers just as you are. Just mm -hmm. as FTE funding is important to a school, so is uh, statistics uh, in, a, in, a, in a policing community. That's a that's a good point, Sheriff, and thank you so much for being candid and being on here with us. But when you talk about that nuisance, and, and Hatch, I want you to lean into this and our other panelists as well, because your resource in a way that you can get that nuisance more so than you can get the person bringing it in on the plane or the boat. I hear that loud and clear. I guess the question in that is, man, what's going on? Or what, what is the state of conversation in the police community around recidivism? Because whether it be here in Kansas City and during my time as superintendent, the same kids getting sit through the system. You look at the paper there in Burke County, the same people get locked up every other week. And for the record, what's the county doing there or what's going on in the profession, Hatcher and Sheriff, and it doesn't even have to be local to Burke County, around this issue of recidivism. You know, we've heard some things that are going on with pretty progressive folks and law enforcement around trying to reduce the numbers. And just the sheer cost associated with housing someone for these petty things that are a nuisance. What are you doing about recidivism? What's the research in your area saying about recidivism? Hatcher and Officer Hatcher and Sheriff Williams, get us started. Um, here in Miami, man, we 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 are very large. Uh, the, I can only speak to the department I work in. Uh, we have uh, a lot of things that we do with, and we start at a young age with kids. At a, at a very young age, we interact. Uh, we have a nonprofit that uh, I just so happen to be the president of. Uh, and we give out, we have, we, 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 we give out every year for Christmas, we go to an inner city school because, I mean, fortunately, I work in a very predominant uh, successful area where we don't share the same uh, crimes and stuff as maybe some other parts of Miami. But we go to these inner city schools and every year we give out uh, toys, and we adopted a school through our uh, 
Legacy Foundation. Well, like I said, I'm the president. So we give out toys and we have one of our officers dress up as Santa, Santa Claus, and we interact with the kids. We also uh, give out school uniforms and backpacks and all this stuff. And we try to interact with kids at a young age to try to, you know, build and, and stop. As far as uh, programs, I myself personally as an officer uh, started a program, but, and I hate to say it, uh, we messed the program up. I started a program with uh, convicted felons where uh, I lived in, in the South Florida and I lived in what a lot of people call the hood. I lived in the hood for many, many years uh, since I've been living in Florida. And I was an officer living in what they call the hood. And a lot of guys would tell me, officer, uh, I got a felon. I can't get a job. I can't get a job. Nobody will hire me. So what I did was I went to a friend of mine who happened to be a white man and he had a construction company. And he said, listen, I can't hire these guys, but uh, I, will, I, will, I will give these guys a chance through the labor pool. And we gave them a chance and we got them hired and we got them working. But guess what they did? They lied on their uh, uh, hours and wrote down that they worked more hours than what they actually worked. So the program, you know, got dissolved. So, I mean, at, at, at some point, I think, like, I think somebody said it earlier, I think it was uh, Dr. Sam said it earlier. Everybody has to play, take on responsibility in this thing. You have to have some responsibility and have some skin in the game. Laura, lean into that conversation. We're talking about recidivism. And I, I also heard something about a program being dismantled after a mistake made by marginalized folks. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself, because oftentimes the programs that work for the most vulnerable, we look for reasons to end those programs. And so that gives us a reason. And there's a way to balance that and still keep programming. Thank you for elevating that, Hatcher. Laura McDonald, recidivism. So people maybe don't know, but my background before um, organizing was actually working for retired law enforcement, um, creating a anti-recidivism program, if you will, a program designed wow. to keep people um, out, yeah, out of prison. Um, and we specifically um, targeted those in Kansas City who were deemed 67% would go back within three years, right? So we... Um, when you do a recidivism type program to prevent it, quite often what people do is actually they look for the low hanging fruit of people that are going to be successful if they don't um, get an intervention. And mm -hmm. you do need to do an intervention with the people who are most likely to commit a new crime. And so that's what we did. Um, I worked for the retired chief of police, Rick Easley, here in Kansas City at the uh, um, Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission, and they also are the entity that does Crime Stoppers, which people have in um, cities all over the nation, the Crime Stoppers Anonymous Tips Hotline Program. I say all that to say um, failed programs are always the responsibility of the person who initiates the program, not the people who uh, receive the services. And I just like, I wouldn't go out and do law enforcement today because that is not my area of expertise. I'm a social worker. And so I think, you know, the, the cops I work for, the law enforcement officers I work for hired somebody with that kind of experience and background. And then we didn't just do what the white lady thought was cute. We actually did research and I talked to people who were likely to reoffend and we asked all kinds of questions, right? So we learned they needed a job, and we also learned they needed to learn how to keep a job, right? And that street code sometimes translates well into getting your foot in the door, like you can charm somebody, but you maybe can't necessarily keep a job by using street code. And, and you all, hopefully you know what I mean by that. You know, um, somebody comes up and tells you what to do in the streets and you're not going to do that, you know, but somebody comes up and tells you what to do in the workplace in front of your, um, the people that you work around, that should be cool if that's your supervisor and you should just do it. But that's not always what played out with my program participants. So we would actually, we created a transitional jobs program that taught them work skills while we supervised them. And we did it at, at places all over. So that's known as a second chance program and it's here in Kansas City. And it's actually really successful. The last time I checked the rates, um, it was about 14% recidivism wow. in 
population that was recidivating at 67 percent. But I say the people designed wow. the program. They that, those are the kinds of numbers. Those are the numbers we're looking for. And thank you for elevating that. But 14, when normal recidivism recidivism is in the 60 plus percent range. That's the programming that is key because Sheriff hit the nail on the head. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And the same principle, I use that principle in education. It can definitely be parlayed over into the law enforcement space because if we see some programming that's not just punitive in nature, over time, we may not reap the benefit immediately, but over time, there's some shifts that can be made. It breaks my heart to see the same people in the for the record log once a month. Can some I of the same people. Part? It breaks my heart to see it. Go ahead, sure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell a couple more programs about what we have here in Burke County. We are one of the only county jails, county jail, not, not a state prison. We're one of the only county jails in the state of Georgia who employs a social worker to, to help reduce recidivism. Now, as you know, a county jail is different from a prison in that persons who are in a county jail either have not been found guilty yet or have been found guilty of misdemeanors and they're gonna be in the jail for 12 months or less, mm -hmm. or less than 12 months would be the legal way to say it. So some of those folks may have multiple misdemeanors which may keep them there for, for more than 12 months. But, but so we do have a social worker, we do promote. If you look on my Facebook page, this. Just last week, we, we, we had a, an artistic uh, competition between our inmates, and we posted their drawings on, on our website or on our Facebook so that the public can see uh, what, what's going on. And we're trying to incentivize them to, to avoid recidivism and to, to go out and to get work. And, 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 and that social worker uh, is there to help them navigate their issues and to avoid coming back. So we... we, we push that. Uh, they have tablets in the jail so that they can work and earn GED and educational points. And that social worker is there to help them with the GED if they so desire. And when they get so many educational points, they get to do other things on on, on, on that, uh, that medium. The other thing is, in police work, we have two types of police officers. And I, I really need y'all to understand this, doctor. Yes. Two types. One is a social worker. Two is a crime fighter. Okay, so when you hire some 24 year old stud to be a police officer, he is not interested in social work. He's interested in crime fighting. So he wants to go out there. He wants to write the tickets. He wants to catch the drug dealer. He wants to get the bad guys. He's not interested in, in, in the, the, the societal ills and trying to fix those. And, and, and then you have this, the, the group of folks who are social workers like myself for 30 years. I've been a I'm a police officer, but I'm a social worker type police officer. I'm concerned with quality of life issues. I'm trying to solve societal ills. If, I don't care what we're trying to fix. If it's homelessness, poverty, racism, bigotry, homelessness, teen pregnancy, there's only one way to do it. One way, and that's through education. Wow. Now, that education doesn't have to be a college degree. It can be a technical skill. It could be just educating you on on the fact that you are not equal to that person who, whose skin is lighter than yours. You might be equal in your mind, but you're not equal in society. That's education. That's uh, my brother in law is a coach in Atlanta at Alatoona High School. And he called me after the the arrest of the persons in Brunswick. And he said, I have two small boys. And he was a grown man crying like a baby. And he said, what can I do to help fix this injustice? He lives in a predominantly white neighborhood in Cobb County. And I said, you can get your two little black boys and take them in the kitchen and sit them down at the table and help them understand just because we have a black sheriff, just because we've had a black president, doesn't mean that they're going to be able to acquiesce to those same positions and we have got to stop fooling ourselves and just because you take the little white kids into your basement and they play together and have fun at the end of the day they still have to realize that their skin color is different and, and and life is not fair and things are not equal that's what you can do and you don't have to do anything on a grand scale we don't have to wait on another martin luther king or barack obama or, or, or Dr. Carpenter to, to, to affect real change. We've got to do it one at a time in our own households first, and then you can go abroad. We won't even fix our own families because we've got two or three families and we just won't do right. 
that's what's going on in the black community. That's why we require more services. It's not necessarily it, all, all of us on this phone call, with the exception of Ms. McDonald, I don't know her status, but the rest of us grew up fairly poor. And, and the police is not pulling us over every week and the police is not locking us up every week because we had a foundation that was different from what some others have. And I realize that everybody doesn't have equal opportunity, but we've got to change the dynamics one at a time. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. I, I can call you up here, but I tell you what, I've been pulled over more in Missouri than I was ever pulled over in Georgia, and and I was more educated than as I've, I've been. I'm the most educated I've ever been right now. And you're right, that rear end didn't help when fella told me on a two lane road that I was violating the law, which is driving in the fast lane. That that lane is for passing only, and no one's on the road except a Corvette who sped by me and a country truck with a broken tail light on it. But I'm the one that got stopped and they went on up the road. So granted, there's something there. And I believe education is super important as it relates to ending recidivism or ending that first look behind prison doors. But here is one thing that I will say also, we have to. We know that we don't have the number of officers that oftentimes reflect the community they serve, whether it be racially, they don't reflect the community, or whether it just be from a background experience standpoint. So because that is not the case, we must delve into these issues of bias. And you hit it, sure. It's an education. It's important there. I died on that sword. If I ever chose to go back into the superintendency, I die on it again. Because we know that there's an over-policing and there's an under-schooling going on with kids of color. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Doctor. I will say this, that that it doesn't, uh, to a police officer, he's looking for a guy committing a crime. He really, you know, when you're running radar from 1,500 feet away, you don't know what color the person is behind the wheel. You can't even see that far. So, So, you know, I mean, it's, we we but but we can't be riding dirty or or we can't be speeding and 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 the car reeks of marijuana and then expect that the officer is going to turn his head. He's concerned about a violator. He's not concerned necessarily about color. Do I think that we have racist police officers? Of course I do. Do I think that 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 uh, you know other professions have them? Of course. But. We, but I, I agree with you. We've got a long way to go to professionalize ourselves. We're doing it here in Burke County. We're, we're doing it. And, and, but it needs to be going across the country. Look, I go to sheriff's association meetings with 158 other sheriffs in Georgia. And trust me, there are some who really need an education on service and humility and race and social inequality. They do. They do. And I'm first to admit it. And I submit that it's not just Georgia, but Florida and South Carolina and everywhere else. Yeah, we're yeah, going to the United States mm -hmm. without a hate crimes bill. Right. Uh, hopefully that's coming soon uh, right. in light of this this new situation in Brunswick. So sometime it's about timing. Yeah, we, we got some questions coming in from the audience. Thank you. Absolutely. It is about timing. And thank you for that. We have Ebony Hall. She's joining us from Washington, D.C., but Ebony says diversity and inclusion must reflect the community. Going back to requiring you to live in the community also will go a long way to eliminate implicit bias and over policing. That's an interesting one. And that's something that we are dealing with right here in the Kansas City area. There was some ruling that called for our police officers to live in the community. But now the state legislature has gotten involved. Lori, can you speak to that? Yes. So oh a uh, residency law in Kansas City, Missouri, that all city employees have to live in in the city limits, which is huge. You can live anywhere. It can be very suburban, right, or very urban, depending on what you like. But these guys decided to petition and, and go after our state legislature to change that law and create some preemptive legislation so that couldn't happen. Um, and it's all embroiled in many things right now. So not only do they not have to live in the communities they police, they're asking to not live in the city they police. And I think it just, it, it, it makes for some, there's a reason why I don't live in the rural community I grew up in and it's racism. I don't wanna be around that that prevalently all day, every day. And I don't think we wanna draw officers from those communities more than we are already, you know? 
Absolutely. D, I saw you said that it's required in Kansas City. It is, but be on the lookout. There's some legislation that's playing itself out. And unfortunately, the police union has been heavy in getting it lifted. Uh, but Doctor, I, I would submit that you probably need to look at things like hiring and retention. Yeah. If, if you're gonna now, Kansas is a is a large city, uh, but when you if you try to bring that to Waynesboro, Burke County, we're the second largest county in the state by land mass. But in a county of twenty two thousand people, you'd be hard pressed to be to hire and retain good qualified staff if you require them to live within the county and and uh, it just wouldn't happen same uh not to cut you off sheriff but same and the dr company uh i can't really say where i work but you've been where i work there's no way i could afford to live where i work like it, it, it ain't even feasible so right. i mean you know I, I i listen me personally i think that when when, when police officers in the black community the way we offer the job is also uh uh is very critical too because you know growing up like sheriff williams i lived across the street from him. he always wanted to be law enforcement ever since i known him that wasn't i had no intentions of being law enforcement and i look at myself as a social worker because i do all the stuff at work that a lot of cops that don't want to do and they tell me sometimes like man why do you spend your off day you know giving kids school supplies and this kind of stuff because that's what i enjoy doing uh, I enjoy doing it, but I, I, think that, work. Yes. Have, I think that we have to catch these young kids. We have to explain to them that listen, if you don't have if you don't have the resources to go off to college as soon as high school or whatever, then maybe consider a job in law enforcement because you can make a a, a good living. In most cases, most departments, most police departments throughout this country, or especially in the inner city. They pay for college. They give college reimbursement. So it's just it's just how we catch these people at a young age and engage them at a very very young age and let them know that the police is not here to um, take you to jail. It's difficult because nobody that word policing. Nobody wants to be police. A lot of people don't want to be police. So it's very difficult, you know, to to hire and try to find the right people. To, to fit law enforcement sometimes, especially in our communities. You know, I hate Absolutely. one more thing. I hate being in uniform and uh and it happens more with 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 African American parents. They see you in a grocery store or whatever in uniform and they have their kids and they go, they're gonna police, he's gonna get you. No, I'm not gonna get you. I'm not gonna get you. It doesn't happen in yeah. my that's that community element that's super, super important. This is the Good Trouble Equity Talk. We are talking about policing in the black community. Thank you all for joining us. We are about three minutes from wrapping or two minutes from wrapping. So I'm gonna give the panelists an opportunity to lean in, but thank you for joining Aspirational Insights, Good Trouble Equity Talk. Sean Kirkwood said, no one is defending criminals, black nor white. My issues are how law abiding black citizens are presumed to be engaged in criminal activity just for being. And I think it's hard to be a black man in these United States and not having experienced some feeling of that. I can tell you that I can't plaster doctoral degrees on my head. I can't plaster more professional development in a pinky than most law enforcement officers not, going to your point. Not a sure, not a can I respond to Sean? And that's, can I, that's for a reason. Hold on. And can so I we, to Sean? Cannot, we cannot um, plaster that on our foreheads. So I guess the question is, how do we get law enforcement and the law enforcement community to just let us breathe? Just let some of us breathe because it's not always that need for more services in the light. Somebody saying we need part two. Thank you all for sticking in with us. I'm going to go around to my guests and give them one last word. Where can people find you? What do you want to be your last takeaway? Start us off, Laura McDonald. You can find us at uh, Metro Organization for Racial and Economic Equity. It's more2.org on the, on the internet, more2.org or on Facebook. I, I just want to lift up the Hardys in the Lake again. I just I got really stuck there at Hardys, and I wanted to be with you all there. Um, but but yeah. you said Hardys in the Lake, you know, the response was the people at Hardys aren't 
the people at the lake aren't shooting each other or the people at the lake aren't, but why people do commit crimes, it's why I do this work because I saw the disparity and how I was treated by law enforcement versus my counterparts. And so I wanna be really plain about this. Part of the problem is we treat black people as a monolith, right? And you, Dr. Carpenter, or Dr. Carpenter with a PhD, you're not anything like the guy that I worked with who didn't know how to act at his job, you know, you're not the same people, right? And, and, and so I think that's the problem is we're looking for the people at Hardee's and it's not always, sometimes it's the people at the lake causing the most problems. And in fact, the people at the lake are the ones that vote the wrong people in office. And the people at the lake are the ones that aren't getting involved in school issues and aren't sticking up. And they're the ones raising white kids that go out and mass shoot people. I mean, the people at the lake have flipping problems, right? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Laura. Thank you. It seems like you live down there with us. Dr. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Carpenter. I appreciate this opportunity. I, um, I think one of the things I'd like to close out with is something that you raised earlier in regards to your experience being a professional black man still having to deal with um, looking like any other individual that may, you know, come in contact with with any other person who is not of color. Right. So, you know, we, we have to we have to really, really spend time dissecting that piece of the conversation. I saw a couple of comments being made about uh, those of us who are who are of color have to deal with things simply because of our color that others don't. And someone talked about the protesters that are protesting, you know, out in front of courthouses and state legislatures across the country and what they're able to get away with versus those of us who are simply trying to go for a jog or simply trying to get home from school. And so at the end of the day, what I want everybody to understand is that no one is asking for extra anything. No one is asking for anything to be done any better than anybody else. I just simply want to be able to exist just like you. And until you give me that opportunity, and until we are willing to call whatever it is, that thing that it is, that R word, which is called racism, then we're not gonna get anywhere. And so let's, let's engage in this conversation in a broader context. I hope that this will not be a singular uh, situation, but the, it could be something that is more ongoing because the candor is really important. The way in which we've engaged, the things that my, my brothers in law enforcement, who I respect immensely, the way in which they were able to articulate their point of view is not my point of view. I've never been in law enforcement, but I've been black all my life. And so I want to be able to make sure that we can engage in this conversation productively, but also that it does impact the kind of change that we want to see in our community. Thank you, Doc, man. Thank you for spending the time. I know your schedule is super hectic like all of our other panelists. Thank you for your time. Party shot, Officer Hatcher. Yes, uh, Dr. Carpenter and to the other panelists, uh, thank you guys for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I, 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 I wanna say something, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's two types of police department that, that we can have. And hopefully we can have another panel and I can, I mean, another another uh, meeting like this. And I want to leave you guys with this to think about it. You either can have proactive policing or reactive policing. And we as a black community have to decide whether we want proactive or we want reactive. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody here understands. I don't, you know, the difference between proactive and reactive. And lastly, I want to leave that I hear, you know, people say, you know, uh, a black man, a black man, a black man. But if 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 it's hard, if it's hard for a black man without a uniform, imagine being a black man in a uniform. Because I'm a black man too, and it's just as hard for me to put my uniform on and go to work and do my job and stay professional when you know I'm getting I'm getting beat up by the black community before they even know me, before I'm even given a chance to help them. So these are conversations, yes, that we, that yeah, it, it, I mean, we need to have more of these. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, man. Sheriff Williams, man, you're in broad in a tough race down there, and you got the Democratic primaries coming up pretty soon. Give us your parting shot, sir. Thank you, Dr. 
Robin, for this opportunity. I really enjoyed the, the discussion tonight. It's been very fruitful. And, and, and I, I just want to say very quickly, uh, Hatcher made a very good point. We, we get beat up by our, our own folks sometimes. I really want us to leave here not thinking that uh, if we have more black or brown, whatever, that, that things are going to be better. We've got to have people with a spirit to serve and not be served. I just wrote a book called Not to Be Served, and it'll be coming out the day after the election. I'll wow. get a copy of it and figure out how to how to serve mankind and not serve ourselves. We need to hold politicians that we elect accountable. That's the biggest issue. Everybody is concerned about what does it take for me to stay in power uh, and, and not what's 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 best for the majority. And and I live and most of my life, I've lived in, a, in my adult life, I've lived in predominantly white neighborhoods. Uh, when I when I was in shape in 2006, I used to go running through the neighborhood in Columbia County, and my wife would say, it's cold outside. Why don't you put on a skull cap? And I said, you're crazy if you think I'm going to run through this neighborhood with a skull cap on. I'm just not going to do it. So I have to think about where I am. Every day when I go to work and I go to meetings, I have to remember that I'm black and, and that, that things are not equal, things, everything is not fair. So, but it's incumbent upon each of us to police ourselves, to police our families, to raise them, understanding that things are different and, and respect those differences. But, but if we're gonna make it better, we gotta do it through education. That's the only way to fix our society, societal ills is through education. And that education comes in different forms. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. You you know, you have a lot of firsts on this panel today. Dr. Sams can probably write a list of the first he's been as it relates to his career. And I definitely can do the same many firsts for me. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. And there's a lot of pressure that comes with that being first as an African-American sheriff. So we like to keep you in that space of accountability as it relates to being the first. You know, if, we, if we're not at the table, we can't help make decisions. We're absolutely. at the table. We want to continue to be at the table. And we, we have the best interests of everybody at heart. We do recognize that there are some inequities uh, with regards to race. And we're trying to, to make those those situations better in, in the Burke County community. Absolutely. We got three or four people saying, excellent panel. We need part two. And these are community servants. They do this because they're serving. And I just want to say to you all, I may be calling you for part two. Thanks to everyone for being on tonight. Thank you. We're going to end the broadcast. I'll debrief, debrief with the team. But thank you all so much for joining. Peace. Okay. In broadcast. Now, I should keep you all. Okay. I should keep you all.